Tattooed men were one of the most popular acts in the sideshow of the 1930s. These people were completely tattooed from head to toe, creating living, breathing works of art. In today's episode of Unusual As Usual, we're going to peel by the layers of the enigma that was the Great Army, aka Horace Fridler. Horace Leonard Riddler was born in Surrey, England in 1892. His origins are a tangle of rumours and mysteries which more than likely helped him reinvent himself later on in life. According to at least one version of his story, Riddler was born into an upper class family. Growing up, he enjoyed a relatively privileged childhood, enjoying the benefits of private schooling, a happy home life and being well travelled. He attended one of Britain's most prestigious institutions, Oxford University, where he whiled away his time enjoying the lush greenery of the courtyards and reading books upon books cover to cover off the dusty old shelves in the library, effortlessly graduating with honours before nobly pursuing a career in the British Army. Around the age of 22, just at the beginning of the First World War, Riddler, like most fit, healthy and able-bodied young men, offered their services to Prime Minister Herbert Asquith by enlisting into the army. Here, he slowly worked his way up the ranks and, according to the London Gazette, on the 9th of September 1915, he was promoted from Lance Sergeant to Second Lieutenant. At the end of the war, Riddler left the military, where he had now rose to the rank of Major, and he returned back to his home in Surrey. But soon after arriving, his father unexpectedly died. This unfortunate turn of events deeply affected Riddler and he plunged into a deep depression. As his world slowly unraveled, he turned to alcohol for comfort. His situation was only exasperated by the substantial inheritance his father left him in his passing. Riddler rapidly squandered his inheritance on outlandish parties, fast women and slow horses, and by 1922, with few prospects and only a small army pension left, he decided to become an act in the sideshow. Reportedly, during his time serving in the British Army, Riddler had acquired several small decorative tattoos, but now aged 30, he decided to take it to the next level. And that show business would be his new platform. He built on his first few pictorial tattoos, adding larger illustrations and began exhibiting himself in small sideshows. This, along with his army pension, afforded him a modest living as he performed in music halls and fairgrounds across the UK. But it was far from the success he had hoped for. His early tattooing efforts were crude and he soon realised that that style of tattooing was no longer enough to make him marketable. If he wanted to become a household name, he would have to grab the bull by the horns, go big or go home, and he certainly did. At some point between 1927 and 1934, he visited famed London-based tattooist George Burchett with a plan that would transform him into the greatest modern tattooed attraction the world had ever seen. Burchett had become one of the most famous tattoo artists in the world in his own right, and was a favourite among the wealthy upper class and European royalty. Among his customers were King Alfonso XIII of Spain, King Frederick IX of Denmark, and rumour has it, King George V of England. Burchett and Riddler soon got to work designing the iconic stripes that would bring the Great Army to life. They designed the thick black stripes in such a way that would cover Riddler's old artwork and, by Burchett's account, 500 sittings and 150 hours of tattooing later, Horace Riddler became the Great Army. The work cost Army around £3,000, but he would later claim it had cost closer to £10,000. Regardless of which was more accurate, Burchett declared he never received the full amount that he was owed. To complete his look, Riddler had his ears pierced and stretched to accept large gauge jewellery. 
He also went on to get a large septum piercing that resembled a bull ring through his nose. Quite fittingly, this procedure was performed by a friend who worked as a veterinarian. He hired a local dentist to file his teeth into sharp points and began to wear elaborate costumes completing his physical transformation. After this radical metamorphosis, the job offers soon began rolling in. Gladys Riddler, Horace Riddler's wife, began working with her husband, introducing the great army to the stage. She would tell a fanciful story of his harrowing ordeal of being captured in New Guinea, being tortured by savage tribemen and his body being modified against his will. This story, along with his striking look, captivated his audience. And while today this story seems completely implausible, at the time a general lack of knowledge about many areas of the globe provided a perfect opportunity for performers to play on the audience's ignorance. Imagine what was going through their mind as the great army stood centre stage, an illustrated man with more ink on his flesh than blood coursing through his veins. His ornate jewellery glinting in the spotlight as he smiled his toothy grin. Women would occasionally faint at the sight of him, an act fondly known in the sideshow as a falling ovation. As the years wore on, Omi's appearance became more and more outrageous. He took to wearing lipstick and nail polish and signed his pitch cards, Barbaric Beauty. His stories became even more fanciful, less believable but no less colourful. On the 6th of June 1939, Ormi and his wife arrived at the World's Fair in Queens, New York. Just a few days later, the couple reported being attacked with a knife, claiming that Ormi's face had been slashed by an unknown assailant. No photos of the injury were ever taken and the New York Police Department had no logged record of the incident. However, on the 10th of June 1939, the New York Times, the New York Daily Mirror and the New York Herald all reported the incident, in true tabloid fashion, never letting the truth get in the way of a good story, leading some to believe the attack may have just been an elaborate ploy to drum up publicity. Immediately following his appearance at the fair, Olmi appeared at Robert Ripley's auditorium now known as the world famous Ripley's Believe It or Not franchise, where he performed as the star attraction. Ripley contracted Omi for six months, the longest time Ripley ever showcased a single performer at his auditorium. During that period, Omi appeared more than 1,600 times, often performing up to 10 shows a day. Ripley's auditorium wasn't his only appearance in 1940. Omi also toured with the great Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus, where he performed under the moniker Omi the Zebra Man. He was billed as the star attraction in the sideshow, but ultimately left the circus after only one season. In recent years, multimedia artist Anthony Bennett has created a life-size hyper-realistic statue of Omi, which regularly tours the UK. And even Homer Simpson has sported Army's trademark stripes on occasion. Shortly before his death in 1969, Army was quoted saying, Underneath it all, I am just an ordinary man. Which goes to show, despite his appearance, beauty is only skin deep. And there we have it, the enigma that was the great Army, Horace Riddler. How about you? Would you ever get a tattoo? Maybe you already have. Let me know in the comment section below and as always, don't forget to like and subscribe. That's all we've got time for today, but I'll see you all next week. And remember, stay unusual as usual. If you've enjoyed this video, you might like this one too. If you want to see more modified marvels, you can check out the full playlist by clicking here. Don't forget to ring that bell to make sure you don't miss out on next week's video and if you have any ideas on what the next episode should be about, make sure you add it to the comment section below.